for that. Uh, Mr. Hutton, for 10 minutes, thank your you. last, please. I'd like, to, I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to, t to give testimony. Uh, I rep represent FAIR, which stands for the Federal Accountability Initiative for Reform. And FAIR is Canada's first public interest organization created to protect whistleblowers, by which I mean employees who speak out to protect the public interest uh, when they see wrongdoing. Uh, and FAIR has been doing valuable work in this field for the past 11 years. I'm going to cover two closely related uh, topics in my remarks. The first is uh, I want to comment on the nature of the management systems that, upon which the industry and ultimately the public uh, are increasingly dependent uh, for ensuring food safety. And I'll also comment on the vital role that whistleblowers play in protecting the public when these systems fail. Uh, and, and the challenge of protecting these people. I'll start with the food industry. As we've heard in this testimony over the past several weeks, uh, the food industry is changing rapidly from a host of modest family farms to a few industrialized producers operating on a huge scale. Now, just like transporting people in ever larger passenger planes, uh, this creates economies of scale and it's, it's very efficient while it works. But when it goes wrong, the results can be catastrophic with, uh, with many lives lost. Uh, we've also heard a great deal about management systems being implemented in the industry as a safeguard. And I want to comment on that because before I took on my current role, uh, I spent my career in industry as an executive and uh, a management consultant uh, working in management systems. Uh, I've, uh, I've been working in this field since the, the mid-80s which is before you know, the food industry began to be become interested in the subject. And I've written a couple of books on the subject that have been translated and distributed on four continents. So I feel comfortable in making some observations about management systems. And I'd like to tell you that obviously without these systems uh, and the techniques that they embody, it would not be possible today to build a reliable automobile or to safeguard the blood supply or to launch men into space. So, uh, and it's no accident that HACCP, which we've heard so much about, had its origins in NASA. Um, and as our food system evolves into a vast industrial complex, uh, it won't be possible to have a safe food supply without very expert and diligent e implementation of these systems. However, these systems, as effective as they are when they're working well, they are fragile. And this is a key point because they require considerable expertise to implement and um, cons absolutely consistent support from management, from the CEO right down. And the moment that the technical expertise is compromised or the management support weakens, then the system begins to degrade and it will likely soon fail. And all it takes for our su food supply then to be poisoned is for one company in financial difficulty to start cutting corners or for one manager, perhaps in night shift somewhere, to overlook a problem rather than stopping the production line to fix it. Uh, we're only one bad actor or one incompetent decision maker away from a catastrophe. And uh, this is not an empty claim. If you look at the USA, uh, USA recently suffered, suffered a devastating salmonella outbreak, one of many outbreaks they've had. This particular one, uh, sickened an estimated 19,000 people in 43 states. It uh, contributed to nine deaths, and it uh, triggered the largest food recall in U.S. history, and indeed an international food recall. Uh, all of this was caused by one family-owned peanut plant in Georgia. That's right. Uh, about half of those who fell ill were children, so you begin to see how vulnerable we are. And that's why it's absolutely essential, in my opinion, that we have mechanisms in place to inform us when things are going wrong before disaster strikes. So I'll turn, uh, I'll turn to whistleblower legislation. Um, the typical whistleblower is not someone who rushes off uh, some kind of crusader to find problems and, and uh, publicize them. They are typically ordinary uh, employees doing their job conscientiously who find themselves in a situation where they uh, see some wrongdoing going on or they 
come into possession of some information that is embarrassing to their business, to their employer or their bosses. Uh, and then they put themselves at risk by trying to bring that to management's attention. So the whistleblower is someone who puts them, their career at risk in trying to protect us, um, not someone who uh, is acting irresponsibly. Now, it's, I think it's just plain common sense that if everyone in the food industry, I, government and, and the private sector, could speak out freely if they see matters of concern, then we'd be a lot safer than we are today. But there is a compelling statistical evidence from other sectors which suggests that whistleblowing is potentially the most effective way that we have for exposing problems and wrongdoing. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, shouldn't people come forward anyway? Why do they need protection? And I'd like to emphasize that the typical experience of someone who tries to draw attention to concerns that their bosses don't want to hear about is that they suffer vicious and calculated reprisals, uh, attempts to isolate them, to make their colleagues frightened to speak to them, um, to humiliate them. And this abuse and bullying typically goes on until the employee can't take any more. And at some point, their doctor will say to them, you can't go to work anymore because it's killing you. And at that point, the organization has succeeded in ridding them from the workplace and silencing them. And it goes further than that because employers will very often make every attempt to prevent the whistleblower from being employable. So they not only lose their immediate job, but their career. And uh, one US expert remarked that the typical fate of a nuclear engineer whistleblower is to end up selling computers at Radio Shack. And that's certainly my observation too. Uh, so the consequences for these people uh, are and their families are enormous. A loss of livelihood, loss of their careers, loss of the home, very often loss of the family. And they typically end up with post-traumatic stress symptoms, uh, nightmares, flashbacks, chronic depression. Uh, regrettably, some are driven to commit suicide. Now, you might think that this type of behavior, you might expect it from a firm whose profits are threatened, but surely not from a government employer's. And as Canadians, we've been raised to trust our government. But you'd be entirely wrong. And I, I want to give you just a one or two examples. Uh, the founder of this organization, FAIR, is uh, Joanna Galtieri, who blew the whistle on waste and extravagance in foreign affairs in the early 90s and was harassed out of her job. She sued her bosses for harassment. And that lawsuit is now in its 11th year. Uh, if you say, how could it possibly take so long? Well, government lawyers paid by us have dreamed up more than 10,500 questions to put to her and have subjected her to more than 30 days of pretrial examination when the norm is one day. Um, and this is not an unusual example. You've also heard of Shiv Chopra and the Health Canada whistleblowers who, um, who lost their jobs after testifying to the Senate. The Senate was unable to protect them and they've had to take legal action to try and regain their jobs. And their hearings have been going on for close to five years now. Now, in Canada, we're latecomers to whistleblower protection. Um, the public sector, the Public Servants Disclosure Act came into force in 2007, and it was claimed to offer ironclad protection to whistleblowers and to be the Mount Everest of uh, whistleblower legislation around the world. Uh, unfortunately, those claims seem quite ridiculous today. We have a public sector integrity commissioner who's an agent of parliament who, and a substantial staff, a budget of six and a half million. After two years of operation, her office has not found one single example of wrongdoing in the entire federal public service. So our view is that whistleblowers in Canada are not in any way protected, and there's not even the pretense of protection for them in the private sector. So I'm going to leave you with one very simple message, uh, which is based on two decades of experience that I've had in, with management systems and what I've learned about whistleblowing in the past five years or so. And uh, if you don't remember anything else, then please remember this. In my opinion, unless we create effective whistleblower protection for people working in the food industry, from the public servants who make policy and oversee uh, the industry to the managers and workers on the production lines, 
Canadians will continue to die needlessly because of avoidable failures within the food supply. And I'm not claiming this is a comprehensive solution. Uh, obviously, there are many things have to be done. I'm saying it, it's a, a very important component that can provide a safety net uh, when everything else goes wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Hutton.